Uh, hello and welcome to the University of Florida, St. Lucie County Solutions for Your Life television show. Uh, today we are going to be talking with Dr. Garima Kakar. Uh, Dr. Kakar is our alternative ag and fruit crops agent. Garima, welcome. Thank nice you. to have you with us. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, uh, let's start off a little bit about uh, you telling your, uh, telling me about yourself and the audience about themselves, yourself. and Sure. So I am Fruits and Alternative Crops Agent at St. Lucie County. And this position is uh, in cooperative collaboration with the university and two counties here, St. Lucie and Indian River. And I've been in this position for uh, over a year now uh, at IFS. Uh, but I would say that I have been part of UF IFS for uh, almost a decade now. I started here as a master's student back in 2008 at uh, Tropical Research and Education Center in Entomology Department at University of Florida. So, uh, by the way, T Tropical Research and Education Center is one of the 13 centers uh, University of Florida has. So, uh, TREC, we call TREC uh, over there, I did my research on thrips and uh, management of thrips, a species which was a new invasive pest at that time in the area, and a pest of vegetable and ornamental crops. Uh, upon completion, I continued my studies at uh, uh, University of Florida again at Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center in Davie, and I studied subterranean termites, their management, and uh, the species specifically I worked on was Formosan subterranean termite, which is another invasive species in Florida. Mm -hmm. Of course, Florida opens a doorway it for. Is. And we get a we get a lot of calls into our office on subterranean termites. That's so. Right. You, uh, you're the go-to person now. So <laughs> you're, you're due to extension, but you're a veteran within the system. Uh, right, okay. right. So I would say uh, my experience uh, uh, in research and being part of UFIFS system uh, really prepared me for uh, working in the extension. And that's when this position came up. And I was ready, with, due to this training, I was ready to take up the greater challenges with citrus industry. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the challenges of citrus. Now, your position is alternative crops and then uh, also fruit crops. But for the most part, you're, you're looking at and working alongside the citrus industry. And we know that it's had its problems uh, over the years, the last, what, 10 years with, with citrus greening. Right. And so let's, let's start there and talk a little bit about that disease. Talk about it not only uh, commercially, but we can talk a little bit about it in the uh, residential and homeowners section as well. Right. So uh, citrus cell... Uh HLB disease or citrus greening or huanglong being, these are all names for the same disease. And this disease is uh, uh, vectored by a small tiny insect, uh, which you can say is uh, of the size of a grain of uh, rice. And this tiny insect vectors it, transmits the disease, uh, which is a uh, bacteria. Um, and once this bacteria is transmitted by psyllids into the plants, uh, they go to the root and they infect roots and they slowly start killing the roots. And once they kill the root, uh, the phloem system is really clogged and there is no upward transportation of uh, nutrients to the tree and the tree basically then uh, dies a slow death. Um, Citrus psyllid was first detected in Florida uh, back in 1998. It's been two decades now. And HLB disease was first detected uh, around 2005, I would say. And since then, what happened to citrus industry is a uh, um, uh, history. And yeah, it's, it's hard to, to imagine that something uh, as the size of a piece of rice can bring <laughs> the citrus industry to its to its knees. So let's talk a little bit about that in terms of, of acreage loss and production of citrus loss. So we have almost 50% uh, of acreage loss, I would say, in St. Lucie County itself. Um, this year's forecast is uh, around uh, 4 million boxes. Think about times uh, when we used to have uh, uh, double uh, the number of boxes that we are getting this year and um, and this is like 40 percent decline as compared to the number of boxes we produced last year and this tiny insect 
all it needs is 15 minutes of feeding on an infected tree to get the bacteria inside it and then it's once the bacteria in it all it has to do is feed on a healthy plant and transmit the bacteria and cause the so disease. So where on the tree will that insect feed? Where does it like to feed most? So the uh, Asian citrus psyllid, they prefer feeding on young flush, uh, soft tissue because it's easier to uh, uh, suck sap and they prefer those areas uh, and they also prefer to actually reproduce on those area and they lay their eggs on the surface of those young flush, young leaves of citrus tree and that's where those uh, eggs then hatch and it has five immature stages and they pass through those five immature stages before they develop into an uh, adult. So, these so, so what's the time between the, the egg being laid and the full mature adult? Well, it all depends upon the temperature because an insect life cycle is dependent upon temperature. If you have higher temperature, they would pass through the life cycle faster because uh, each stage, the, the duration for each stage would be shorter. Uh, but it's just a matter of a couple of days that they finish their life cycle and uh, they are adult. And once they have acquired uh, the bacteria, uh, and they have wings, the adult forms can fly, uh, they can transmit the... Disease. So two days, you're saying? From Couple, uh, I would say more than two days, two? yes, okay. yes, yes. And so they'll, they'll feed on a, a tree that is, that's infected with the virus, mm -hmm. and then they'll go off to another tree, mm -hmm. and then they'll feed on that tree... And pass the bacteria. And pass the bacteria right. along. So what what kinds of, of control has the industry looked at to try to prevent the solid from, from spreading this virus? That's a very good question. So since this whole uh, problem is because of this vector, Asian citrus psyllid, so the first, uh, first and foremost strategy for our commercial citrus industry is to manage the vector itself. Now this disease is uh, not seed transmitted, so a vector has to feed, a vector which has the bacterium, it has to feed to be able to pass the, uh, the bacteria and cause the disease. So uh, they are looking at control strategies uh, to manage this uh, pest itself so that uh, there is less of vector and there are uh, there's less of chances of getting trees infested infected okay. with it. So the the psyllid is right. the vector. Right. Okay. Psyllid is the vector. Alrighty. Yes. And so at they you've gone ahead and the industry has gone to great lengths to try to control the psyllid, but there's some other things, some other processes that the industry is trying to trying to do the use of of uh, micronutrients mm -hmm. and the use of bactericides. That's Can we right. talk a little bit about that, please? That's right. Uh, so we know that vector is there. They are trying their level best to manage the vector. But the bacteria is also already in the trees. And we have almost, as they say, almost all of the trees in uh, infected with the bacteria and diseases there. So they are trying to now uh, control the bacteria also in trees by the use of bacteria sites. Streptomycin and oxytetracycline are the two bacteria sites commercially being used to manage the bacteria tighter within the trees. Now growers, they are doing three treatments on average uh, uh, application of these bacteria sites in a year. Uh, but the problem is these bacteria sites are pretty expensive and uh, I would say the average cost of applying those bacteria sites per acre is like around $120, but it can go as high as $180 as well. So what happens is to able to compensate on their cost of production now growers are cutting down on the vector management. And that oh, is... Oh, so they're not... They're right. not trying to control right. the psyllid as much because they have they, to take that money and put it towards put, the growers bacteria. Are, yeah. Yes, growers are limited with their uh, input costs, so they just do not want to uh, in, go really high with their cost of production. Uh, they have to make uh, profits at the end. Sure. So they are cutting down costs uh, at uh, uh, the insecticide application to be able to uh, uh, 
put that money in the bacteria side application. But then again, uh, the problem is with increased vector, uh, we have increased titer of bacteria. If there is more vector with bacteria inside it, once they feed, the titer of bacterium increases inside the trees. So we are really promoting an IFS researchers and citrus extension agents collaboratively, collab collaboratively we are trying to uh, promote or uh, let growers know that they have to participate in chimas. Uh, those are oh, coordinated okay. sprays where they spray together uh, and for a wide area wide management of the psyllid. So the, so the industry are, are basically controlling or trying to take care of, of the bacteria at the same time using the same principles. That's right. All at the same time. Okay. That's right. right. Oh, very interesting. Let, let me ask you a question. What do you what do you figure is the average cost per acre for well, for a citrus grower? <laughs> well, with HLB, it has increased to somewhere I would say average of fifteen hundred. But again, I have uh, heard growers saying that they are putting around two thousand dollars as well per acre. Compared to 10 years ago? Compared to 10 years ago when HNB, HLB was not that prevalent. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, it has, it's probably doubled? It the, has doubled. It used to be somewhere around $800 at that time. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Almost doubled, more than doubled. All right, so it's not enough that we have this little insect the size of a grain of rice, <laughs> uh, right, bringing the, the citrus industry down. We have this big storm the size of That's Florida right. that right. rolled in Irma. That's right. And so let's talk a little bit about the the damages from from that storm. So we are talking about groves that where trees were standing in water for around 48 to 72 hours. What happens is when you have trees standing in water for that long, there is a situation when they suffocate because of lack of oxygen. The, the roots. roots. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Roots. Now, think about those trees are already affected by HLB, those tree roots. And those roots are already uh, 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 declining. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have those trees standing in water, that's actually uh, affecting them in uh, uh, a negative way those uh, already weakened uh, tree roots. So uh, we had trees standing for more than 72 hours. Some of the growers, they were able to get water out within 48 hours, others not. So that really affected the tree health. And there would be latent effects that would be seen in coming weeks. We cannot really say how much impact Irma had at this moment, because there would be more impacts we would see in coming times. But depending upon the value of crop, and the acreage we have in St. Lucie County, you would be surprised that we estimate the value to be around $26 million within the county itself. $26 million loss. That's now, right. You and I went out, we looked at some, right. of the, some of the citrus groves, and what we saw was fruit just just floating, floating it, floating right. in water. Right. And that was almost, that was what, how far uh, down the line was that fruit going to be harvested? Not far, like what, three Not weeks? Not far, they were pretty close to harvest. To farm, yeah. Yes, yes. So besides the root health that was impacted by trees, uh, water in those uh, uh, tree in citrus groves, uh, there was another uh, impact due to the uh, wind damage. We had a lot of fruit drop. Uh, in our county, we estimated there was 40% fruit loss because of uh, wind damage. So that's additional uh, loss to the citrus. Well, I know when I was touring up around the, the north part of the county, mm -hmm. there was you know, 18, 19 inches of rain that was that's right. that the folks had said that they admonished the, the rainfall and that's what the accumulations were. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And it was supposed to be more of a wind event, and it ended up a pretty big rain event. That, that's right. So you're, now, you're, also, you're also looking at alternative crops, because the, the citrus growers are always looking for something else to be able to grow on the land that they've lost to citrus greeting. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the, some of the crops that you're, you're currently looking at? 
That's a good question. So when we uh, are asked for any alternative crops in the region, we always go through the hardiness zone uh, we fall in and what would be the uh, climatic conditions here and depending upon that we select the alternative crops. Now some of the alternatives that researchers are working on uh, include uh, peaches, uh, we okay. have premier citrus, they have a big growth there, they are trying to grow pre peach there but again we live in Florida, hot and humid weather. We have plenty of insects, plenty of pathogens, diseases. So um, our big challenge at this moment are pathogens and uh, one of the insects, Sri Lankan weevil, is impacting. And besides uh, peaches, people are looking at pomegranates. Lychee is another uh, alternative crop here in the area. Yeah, we went out and looked at a, a lychee and longan. <laughs> right. Uh, grove not long ago. Right. So. so a lot of people they think that lychee is a tropical fruit but it's actually subtropical and, okay. and it can grow in this area. It can grow in central Florida and uh, I was surprised that there are a couple of growers that showed up and they showed up their interest in growing lychee in this area and uh, uh, there is a grower close to Felsmere who is uh, who just put on like 200 tree lychee trees so oh. it would be interesting in coming days to see how uh, this alternative crop does compared to citrus we have here. Um, also we have a lot of um, Asian Americans here who have taste developed for lychee but I've seen that uh, in market the uh, even European Americans they are liking the lychee flavor so I see in coming times it can be a, a good alternative to citrus in this area. Well that'll be interesting to see how the trees do up in Felsmere that's more in the central <laughs> that's part right. of the state or considered in the central part of the state so that's, that's right. maybe not even you know considered tropical or subtropical that's either right. one. Yeah. That's right. It would be interesting to look at those. And I would say another uh, important um, alternative crop we are looking at is hops at this time. Ah, yes. <laughs> we have around 300 microbreweries in Florida. I was surprised uh, to know this. And um, in year 2016, uh, we had around, I would say, one uh, million uh, craft beer barrels produced in Florida. Wow. Yes, and that that uh, valued around $2 billion uh, if you take the economic impact. Well, we have, I know we have uh, microbreweries here in St. Lucie. Mm -hmm. uh, we have microbreweries down in the south part of the county, in the, right. the middle part of the county. We That's have right. microbreweries up in the northern part and then also up into Indian River County. So, That's right. yeah, there's, I've noticed yeah. that, that a lot of these brewers have started to come online and so yeah. some of the hops research yep. that's being done. Yes, and I, I know that one research is in collab, you're uh, you collaborating with Dr. Bill Turchik at USDA yep. and looking at uh, how we can grow in this uh, county. Looking at, uh, yeah, different varieties. That's and right. so we had a, a little bit of a hops trial going last year. It was doing well until Irma mm -hmm. came along, and right. so, right. so for all you craft beer drinkers, yeah. uh, you can blame the hurricane on it. <laughs> this so this, year. yes, and especially when these local breweries they prefer to have uh, local hops. Yes, yes, and they are also so they want to give that fruity flavor to their beer so they are looking at um, uh, ingredients they can add to their recipe I would say so some of the ingredients they're looking at are blueberries, uh, strawberries, uh, uh, blood orange, tangerines, grapefruits. I heard that one of the local brewer he actually had this brown ale and he had uh, one of the ingredients as chestnut in oh. his beer. Th that was pretty interesting. <laughs> okay so Let's now. When you f were talking to us and introducing yourself uh, earlier, you you mentioned that you had done some termite research. So <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about that. And this is uh, for the you know for the benefit of the homeowners because we do get a lot of mm -hmm. homeowners coming out asking us to identify uh, two different types, primarily two different types of termites. So. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So we have subterranean termites and we have dry wood termites here. Some of the uh, native species that we have in Florida are reticular termis flavipus, eastern subterranean termite. Then we have uh, virginicus and, and hagenai. But uh, important of important pest amongst these uh, uh, is uh, 
reticular term is flavipus. And then we have some cryptic, uh, I'm sorry, invasive species in Florida, uh, Formosan subterranean termites, and mm -hmm. we have uh, Asian subterranean termites. So these are all subterranean termites I'm mentioning. And then we have dry wood termites, which live exclusively in your wooden piece of furniture and in lumber, uh, those areas. As the name say, dry wood termites, they don't need enough moisture. So they can live, uh, the entire colony of those termites can live in the furniture itself. But subterranean termites, as the name say, they live underground and uh, they, you would not know your house is infested until you see some flying elates in your house. And that means the infestation has already there. And what you see is just the aftermath of infestation. Now, what happens is these termites, once they form colonies, every year they swarm. The reproductive stages, they form enough reproductives, they, comes out, they come out of a colony and they try to explore new places to start another colony. Okay. That's how they grow. And what you see in your house are those elates, winged forms, which are searching for a suitable habitat where they can start, start their colony. You would usually see them on windowsills, bathtubs, uh, sinks, those are the areas. If you see those, bring those samples to us. I would suggest bring um, uh, we suggest grow homeowners to bring us uh, soldiers because those winged elates and soldiers are the cast that we look at for identifying. And based on what we identify that species of termites to be, we make recommendations. Okay, you have dry wood, this is the uh, uh, control strategy you can use. Okay, this is subterranean, this is the control strategy to be used. But the key is, is to make sure that whatever termite it is, subterranean or dry wood, that it's properly identified first because there's two different two different treatments for that. Always, before we, I always say, if you go to a doctor, doctor has to first diagnose the problem to be able to give you the treatment. Right. Same goes for bugs. We need to identify because uh, one chemical that works for one kind of bug may not work for the other. So we need to know what kind of bug exactly it is to be able to give proper recommendations. Great. Now. In the, in the last couple of minutes, I, I want to touch on a subject that I know you are particularly interested in, <laughs> and that is uh, integrated pest management. Okay, <laughs> yes. I know that you uh, you did a lot of your work in that field uh, while you were a master student and also during your PhD, PhD work. Yes, and let's let's so let's talk a little bit about how a homeowner can use integrated pest management in their landscape to be able to identify an insect mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is causing problems to whatever, to their orange tree or their, or their grapefruit tree or to one of their ornamental plants. So kind of walk us through how that system might work. Right. So integrated pest management, first of all, it means integrating different tools to be able to control a pest. A pest can be weed, a pest can be insect, a pest can be any disease. So we recommend that if you uh, want to go through this process, uh, first get it identified with us. If you see a bug, if you see a problem, bring sample to us, put it in a Ziploc bag for us to be able to identify. Uh, usually for insects, we have if you have a bad bug, we ha you have a good bug. You have to be uh, you have to explore a little bit what are the good bugs in your uh, landscape and uh, have to be a little bit detective uh, and find out those good bugs and not spray to kill those good bugs, I would recommend. If you have a problem, bring it and let us make recommendations if you are not sure about the problem. Um, other than that, um, for I would say for homeowners, uh, there are some pesticides that we can recommend to commercial growers, but for homeowners, we uh, limit those because uh, they are not trained to use those commercial pesticides. We recommend using those horticultural oils and other kind of stuff uh, for control management. Of and again, timing is very important in an integrated ma pest management That's system. True. Now, we had talked uh, about the citrusilid in, right. in groves, right, right. And in the commercial industry. But you also could have the citrus psyllid in the homeowner's uh, situation. Right. And right now you have a program with a biological control. That's right. A little tiny wasp. That's right. Right. <laughs> that can uh, use, you can release, that can help 
control the citrusylate. So let's talk a little bit about that. That's right. So cit uh, citrusylate we know is a vector and we are using Temerexia radiata. That's a very tiny wasp um, uh, which is uh, actually grown by FDAX DPI program in Gainesville. So we re are releasing those parasitoids. What happens is that wasp lay eggs inside immature stage of this pest. Okay. And once those eggs are laid, they go through their life cycle and when they turn into adult inside the pest body, they emerge out by chewing a hole and by killing that pest so you have and then once you have that adult parasitoid out that again goes out and look for other immatures and it continues the cycle in this program we are jo requesting homeowners to join hands with us and release that tamarexia in their landscape because some of the growers they have citrus backyard citrus and some of them are actually growing ornamental plants which is also a host of this citrus psyllid so we are requesting them to uh, coordinate with us, collaborate with us. We provide them wasps, they release it in their landscapes, and that would control the psyllids on the east coast. And when wind prevails, usually what happens is it carries psyllid from homeowner's property to commercial growth. So, so it goes from the east, because that kind of blows in right. with Right. With the winds and right. and it'll be you know start along the the east coast wherever along the ocean or along the uh, just you know a couple miles ten miles whatever it is inland and then that's right it just kind of keeps moving out into the that's right into the grove areas and the idea is that since homeowners they are not. Uh, doing those pesticide applications, it'll give opportunity for those wasps to survive in those in those landscape, and it will co control the psyllid population at incipient stages. And once the wind prev prevails, there's not enough psyllid to be blown to the commercial grow. So it'll help the landscape uh, homeowners as well as our commercial citrus growers. All right. So the the phone number that we can that someone can call to ask about how these releases can take place in your yards? Uh, uh, we, we just sent out a survey form that was okay. in PC Palm. And if someone is interested in releasing these wasps in their landscape, uh, we recommend that you contact our extension office, St. Lucie Extension Office. We are located on Pico's Road. And uh, just let us know how many trees you have. And depending on that, we provide those wasps and vials with information and training to release those. All right. And that number is 462. 1660. 1660. So for everyone that has their pencil and paper in hand, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and, and write that down. Well, good. Uh, in, the, in the closing seconds, uh, is there any other types of insects, I guess, good guys that we can look for in our yards that can also help with this integrated pest management? Now, sure. I know ladybugs is one yes, of them. Yes, I was going to mention yeah. that. But we also have these lacewing bugs, which really help, which feed on immatures of lacewing bugs look quite similar to the ladybugs immatures and they feed aggressively voraciously on the immatures of this bad pest uh, we call Asian citrus psyllid. Right and now those those uh, adults will lay their eggs at the ends of silken strings. Yes, Is that right? yes. Yeah. And they look really uh, pretty actually so we have predators and we have parasitoids. Both. All right well, in the closing seconds, Dr. Kakar, thank you for joining you. us today. It's truly, I learned a lot, and uh, hopefully the audience did as well. Thank you for thank having you. me.